I've taken the time to study the all 22 coaches film from the Buffalo Bills week eight win over the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And I'm sharing my top takeaways today on Locked On Bills. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino, author of Go Bills and Buffalo's Run, also the co-host of the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. I want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, and a big welcome and shout out to our everydayers. You know who you are. Those of you who never miss a single episode, I appreciate y'all being here very, very much. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Well, folks, welcome. It's a Saturday podcast, but Thursday night football really just kind of messes up the whole week. And so we got to circle back on a Saturday to get the All-22 review in, and I'm happy to do it. I enjoyed watching this tape, and I have some fun stuff to get into. I want to break down why the offense seemed to respond and show some signs of life and why it looked a lot more like the offense we wanted to see. Of course, some defensive notes, snap counts, studs and duds. You know the things that we do here on the All-22 Review. I would like to acknowledge something here uh, right off the start, and it's that Sean McDermott met with the media on Friday, of course, typical game or day after the game press conference, and he shared that there's no new injuries. And so you got to love that. You play on a short week, you have no new injuries, you have an extended mini buy, like extended rest ahead of your next game against the Cincinnati Bengals. Meanwhile, Cincinnati Bengals got a big game on Sunday against the San Francisco 49ers. And so wanted to put that out there. No new injuries from the Bills win over the Buccaneers. All right, let's get into my notes here from the All-22 study. And look, I announced last week that the Locked On Bill subtext community is now offering a Discord channel to go with it. So nothing changes with the subtext. That still happens, right? We send out mass text messages. We go one-on-one. We talk Bill's football. I'm a text message away. But I added an additional layer, the Discord channel. And what this Discord channel is allowing me to do is share the film clips. And I must have dropped 30 or so clips from the game with commentary. I do some voiceover and talk through the plays and filled up the Discord channel with those clips. And people really seem to enjoy that. And also in the Discord channel, we have, you know, a Bills channel, a Sabres channel, NFL draft, NFL. We have a life channel, a fitness and nutrition channel. So it's a lot of fun in that Discord channel. So check it out. If you join the Lockdown Bills subtext community, you also get access to the Discord And if you want to join, there's a link in today's show notes for you to click on and join. And so whether you're watching on YouTube or wherever you're consuming the podcast, there's a link to join the Lockdown Bill subtext community, which also gets you into the Discord channel. And we are having fun. Don't miss out. Plenty of film clips for you to digest and really supplement uh, the analysis that you're going to get here today. So, folks, why did the offense show the signs of life that we were hoping to see? Why did they find some rhythm? And I know that things kind of tapered off towards the end of the game, stalled out with some fourth and shorts and punting and all that. But for the most part, this Bills offense looked like the offense we want to see. How did they find that rhythm, right? It's been poor, especially at the start of games. And this feels like the Bills took an honest look and asked themselves a very basic question. They said, How can we find more rhythm and we should do those things, right? So you ask yourself the question and then do those things. What's What gets an offense into rhythm? Well, tempo, right? Playing with some pace and some urgency, right? Some no huddle stuff. That's helpful. You kind of get back to your core concepts, right? It's a short week. You hear this all the time. It's a short week. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to kind of do our core stuff and, and execute it at a high level. And they did those things. They ran tempo, and they got back to some of their core concepts and just made it really kind of basic on the offensive side of the football. And I I think it was a smart plan, right? They took advantage of a short week 
to lean into the best things that they do, add some wrinkles to that, and incorporate tempo. So let's expand on that. We'll start with tempo. The Bills ran 65% no huddle in this game. That is a high clip. And it was a big takeaway that many people had coming out of some of the moments where the Bills offense looked good against the Patriots and the Giants and the Jaguars. It was, all right, tempo situations where they're just playing. Well, the Bills did that. And they did that not just in two minute or in those types of situations. It was throughout the game. They picked their spots very wisely to go with tempo. 65% no huddle. That was a great adjustment. They also, of course, probably more due to necessity, they leaned into more 11 personnel and spread concepts. And that doesn't mean that the 12 personnel idea and everything that comes with it can't work. But under these circumstances where you you only have one healthy tight end in Dalton Kincaid, it allowed you to get into some 11 personnel, spread the field, and make it more of a space game. And I think that really kind of worked out based on the opponent the Bills are facing in the Tampa Bay Buccaneers who, you know, press man coverage corners. And I think the way that you can kind of expose them is making them deal with more real estate, right? And and more space that they have to deal with. And so it was a good job of spacing the field and Josh Allen picking matchups, getting the ball out quick and executing. And, And the spacing was really good. You also went back to your core concepts, or not that you went back to them. You built on your core concepts. If you've watched the Bills at all this year, you know that there's two plays that they love. When they pass the football, they love mesh. And mesh is basically where you have a player on the left side of the formation and a player on the right side of the formation. They run over routes at the same level. They get a little bit of a rub in the middle of the field, and usually somebody will break free from that. That's a big core staple of this Bills passing game. And they ran it a ton, which makes sense. We know that the Buccaneers run a lot of man coverage. It's a good man beater, all that type of stuff. But they added some wrinkles to it. You think about that first play, not the first play, but that big long completion to Khalil Shakir uh, that got the Bills down you know, in the low red zone in, in the opening possession. They ran mesh with Gabe Davis and Stefan Diggs, but on top of that, they had a deep over with Khalil Shakir that Tampa Bay just did not expect. And honestly, if Josh got to that throw a little bit quicker, it's going to be a touchdown. And it's unfortunate because the Bills wound up, um, you know, not getting in the end zone there. And uh, it it opened up nicely. They also ran uh, mesh and they had some sit routes over top of where the mesh, um, the rub happens with the mesh. So good wrinkles on top of your core concept. So, hey, we run mesh well. All right, well, what can we add? right in a short week, that's going to open up things. And you could see those if you study the tape and the people in the discord channel know all about this. They, they saw uh, me work through that on our film clips. Um, then it's funny the later in the game, they wound up doing that mesh play with the deep over. And uh, instead of it being Khalil Shakir, they ran the deep over with Stefan Diggs and Tampa was not fooled by that. It wound up being a pretty good play. They hit Khalil Shakir for, uh, a first down on a third down, and he was one of the mesh players. Uh, but they tried to get digs on the deep over, and uh, Tampa was not lulled to sleep like they were when Shakir ran the route. So that was a really good um, incorporation into the game plan, right? A, a lot of mesh, but then some nice wrinkles out of mesh. In the run game, the Bills love to run tackle wrap. They love it. Uh, it's been a huge part of their success running the football and so they ran a lot of tackle wrap in this game and they did a good job of dressing it up they ran it out of a bunch of different looks including a pistol set with Stefan Diggs as the deep running back and James Cook offset to Josh's right put Diggs in some short motion and then come back across with Deion Dawkins uh, on the tackle wrap play as an extra play side blocker and they got an explosive run out of that in addition to a lot of consistency with the tackle wrap. And so um, running it out of different formations, they probably ran it, I don't know, maybe seven or eight times and probably did it out of seven or eight different looks that put the defense in conflict, right? You're, you're doing what you normally would do, but you're making it look a different way. And that makes it more challenging on the defensive side of the football. So core concepts, mesh, tackle rep with good 
wrinkles on top of that. Then you also saw the Bills get the RPO game going, the run pass option. Um, and Josh executed that extremely well. And they took advantage of some good spacing where Tampa at times played some off coverage. And it seems like Ken Dorsey had the right calls at the right times in those moments because you get free access on those RPOs and they were very, very effective in this game for the Bills. That helped Josh find a lot of rhythm in addition to play action, right? 32.6% play action in this game for the Bills. Josh Allen, 9 of 13 for 102 yards and a touchdown. Did have the interception, the goofy, you know, look, batted up in the air, intercepted by a defensive lineman, but you just got back to basics. You got back to basics. Tempo, spread, 11 personnel, mesh, tackle rep, RPOs, play action, and that allowed Josh Allen to play really good football. Josh Allen, his average time to throw in this game was 2.36. And if you've been listening to me talk over the last few weeks, Josh has been over 3.1 in the last two games. And Josh usually hangs out around 2.9. He's never going to be this fast-triggered quarterback that gets it out consistently in under two and a half seconds. But for this game, under these circumstances, he did. And I think that was a, a good plan for him to get the ball out quick and keep him in rhythm. 2.36 seconds average time to throw. That is not a, a, a world where Josh Allen typically lives. So why did that happen? Spacing, RPOs, and involvement of multiple players, right? This wasn't just Josh Allen find stuff on digs. Josh Allen got four different receivers established meaningfully. Khalil Shakir led the team in receiving. Gabe Davis was very productive. Dalton Kincaid, very productive. Stefan Diggs, very productive. You get four guys going in the passing game and you are consistently involving them. There's nowhere for the defense to key. And I thought that was very effective in Josh being able to execute the way that he did. The pass protection was tremendous in this football game. The front five, did a great job, and Josh Allen did a great job as well. Like, we talk about pass protection, and look, a lot of that is on your offensive line. It is. A lot of that's also on your quarterback and understanding where the protection is vulnerable and, and where the free runners could potentially be, and Josh managed it extremely well. A huge week-over-week -week improvement compared to the conversation we had coming out of the Patriots game. And so your front five executed, your protection schemes were sound, and your quarterback operated within them. And so great job there in Tampa. They still blitzed a ton. We talked about them being a blitz aggressive team. They blitzed 43 and a half percent of the time against the bills, a ton of simulated pressures on top of that. And the bills had answers for those pressure looks and Josh Allen took them. So it starts up front, but also Josh Allen's execution behind the offensive line, even when Tampa gave pressure looks and you know the receiver's ability to adjust on the fly. It was all very, very good good offensive football. So that that there's your answer, right? It's it's never just one thing, but hey, you take all these little things and you put them together and it leads to a lot better results than you've had over the last few weeks. Despite again, I acknowledge you wish you had a little bit more there later in the game. Offensive snap counts here. The Bills ran 69 plays on offense. Josh Allen, the quarterback, all 69 of those. Offensive line, the five starters, Stalkins, McGovern, Morse, Torrance, Brown played all 69 snaps. At tight end, uh, Dalton Kincaid played 58 snaps, and then David Edwards played seven. Uh, so somewhat of a workload for David Edwards, but this was really not a 12 personnel game. Reggie Gilliam played two snaps, kind of as a, a wing-type player. Running back, James Cook, 46 of the 69 plays. Latavius Murray, 23. No snaps for Ty Montgomery, or I keep saying Ty Montgomery, um, for Ty Johnson, uh, the Bills running back. I don't know why I keep doing that. I got I to gotta get that tightened up. At wide receiver, uh, Diggs and Davis, 68 snaps. Khalil Shakir, 45. Trent Shurfield, 22. Deontay Hardy, 6. And then Andy Isabella, 0. Um, you're seeing a very clear thing happen. Khalil Shakir is your wide receiver, 3, and he's earned that. He's blocking well. And obviously, the last two weeks, the production has been really good. He's caught in every target that's come his way. He led the team in receiving against the Buccaneers. And you feel like there's some chemistry forming there between him and Josh Allen. It's really cool to see that taking off. So there you have it. That's how the offense got back on track. All right, we're going to get to the 
defensive side of the ball here and really kind of highlight some standout players and of course studs and duds but first i gotta tell you about prize picks folks you gotta check out prize picks it's the funnest most exciting easiest way to play daily fantasy sports the format is awesome it's just you versus the numbers it's not you against thousands of other players including the pros including the sharks it's just you versus numbers here's what you do you select two or more players you pick more or less on their projected stats and you place your entry that is it it doesn't take long Picks can be made in under a minute, and then when you win, the withdrawals are super, super quick. I love watching all these sports right now. Love them even more when I have a prize picks entry going into a slate of games. It just makes it that much more fun. So go to prizepicks.com slash NFL and use code NFL for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, that's prizepicks.com slash NFL. Use code NFL for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Folks, I love DoorDash. I really do. I'm obsessed with it. The convenience is simply unmatched, especially in my busy life. We're all busy, right? We all are struggling to find time to get to the grocery store. We're struggling to find time to uh, make dinner. Well, you don't have to deal with that. DoorDash will bring you what you want right to your front door. And I love getting groceries uh, dropped off right at my front door, but I also love getting food from my favorite local restaurants. We got a place up the street here called Mike's Bagels. They have the best bagels, cream cheese. They have desserts, salads. Um, we we order from them quite a bit. Also, the smoke pit right down the street as well. DoorDash will bring that right to my house. Whatever I want, groceries as well. And they'll make sure it's correct every time. And if there's ever a problem, they will handle it immedi- immediately. So stop worrying about what's for dinner. Stop worrying about when you're going to get to the grocery store. Stop worrying about what you're going to snack on. Let DoorDash handle that for you. Got a deal for you here. Get 50% off up to a $10 value when you spend $15 or more on your first order when you download the DoorDash app and enter code LOCKED23. Subject to change, terms apply. Again, don't forget to use code LOCKED23 for 50% off up to a $10 value your first order when you download the DoorDash app and spend $15 or more. Subject to change, terms apply. All right, let's talk a little bit about this defense here. And... Not that there was any huge themes defensively, but I want to kind of point out some players that I thought stood out to me that I thought was interesting. And I want to start with Jordan Poyer. Back-to-back really strong weeks. I thought the Patriots game was strong. This one was probably better. Feels like Jordan Poyer's kind of back, and that's good. And he's obviously playing safety, but he's also playing the Matt Milano role on some of the long and late downs, obvious passing situations, end of half, end of game, he's playing linebacker. He had 25 snaps of it in this game against Tampa Bay, and that has really shored up some of the leakiness in pass coverage that the Bills have kind of suffered since Matt Milano's been out. And so that has been really encouraging. His run fills were really good. His coverage was good. He had a couple of nice pass breakups. Nice to see Jordan Poyer playing again as an impact starter. Tyrell Dotson started this game, and that's the first time he started since Milano's been out, right? It's been Dorian Williams, and then Dorian's been subbed out for Tyrell Dotson quite a bit. And then in this game, Dorian Williams didn't see the field on defense. And I think that was the correct thing to do. Dorian Williams, for as exciting as he is, and the athleticism, the physicality, It's all really good. He's just not mentally ready to be a high-volume player for a defense, right? I mean, you look at that Patriots game. They knew those shortcomings for Dorian Williams, and they attacked him hard, and he gave up a ton. And you just can't put yourself in that position anymore. And so I think there's a a time and place for Dorian Williams reps, um, but they're not not frequent, right? Not at this point. And, And that's not on Dorian. Dorian's not supposed to play right now, right? He's supposed to be backing up Matt Milano. And so I think the Bills have done a smart thing in in playing Tyrell Dotson. You see the run defense, his ability to play downhill and play into the line of scrimmage is really strong. Now, he's not a guy that's going to thrive in space, right? He's not a dynamic athlete. There's there's some plays even against Tampa Bay where he's isolated up against the running back and it's a short pass. And Tyrell, he's not going to get those angles and make those plays in space, but he gives you a, a floor that makes me a whole lot more comfortable than the floor that exists with Dorian Williams. Now, he doesn't have the ceiling of a Dorian Williams, 
but I think you lean into the floor based on the makeup of your defense right now. And so I thought Tyrell Dotson did some good things in the game, uh, but always, he's also going to have his own shortcomings, but at least it's not mental mistakes. At least he's in position uh, where Dorian's just not ready for that type of volume. So I thought they did a good job. And then har- har- a good job of masking the issues with Do- Dotson is bringing in Jordan Poyer in those passing situations as that linebacker. So I feel like the Bills have a good plan here to manage their personnel uh, the best they can in the circumstances following Matt Milano's injury. Christian Benford, I want to get to him. Uh, he's playing well. I know that he gave up that touchdown uh, to Mike Evans there late and studied the play and not only did it bounce off of Christian Benford's helmet into Mike Evans' hands, I mean, that was a nice bucket throw from Baker Mayfield. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes it just happens, right? Uh, a good throw can beat good coverage. And so I don't think it was an egregious situation. He had some good physical tackles, some good pass breakups, had a tough assignment in Mike Evans and you know, really held him in check for most of that game. Uh, and so I think Christian Benford just continues to be at least a serviceable starter. Um, and I'm excited to see how he develops and grows. Uh, I got a feeling he's going to be a starter for this defense for a while. And you kind of think about this cornerback situation long term, and it's Christian Benford and a bunch of question marks. You know, you go to Trey White. Is Trey White ever going to be Trey White again? And I, I struggle with that. But I mean, and it's an, it's an Achilles injury after an ACL, and he's you know he's getting up there in age just a little bit, and he's never been that elite of an athlete. Does he ever find himself? Can you count on that? Kyer Elam, is he going to be on the team in five days? Dane Jackson's a free agent after the season. Like Christian Benford, it's kind of your only thing that you feel somewhat good about beyond this year at corner. Um, and so it's nice to see him continue to settle in and play good football. I want to mention Von Miller. Um, you know, we're all anxiously watching his return. So far, it hasn't really produced much. Uh, six snaps against the Patriots. He he played a lot more in this game. He played 26 snaps, which was the third most of any defensive end. Still not very effective. Um, go Went up against Luke Gadecki, second-year right tackle out of Central Michigan for Tampa, who's having a good season. And Gadecki's a very athletic player, not super long-armed, um, but more of a I would I hate to call him a finesse player, but I, I just mean that he's more athletic than he is powerful, right? Not a very firm anchored guy. And so Vaughn tried to lean into some speed to power stuff in this game uh to rush, and it's it's not very effective right now. Um, not generating a ton of speed to power conversion to really threaten the width of the pocket and, and the counters off of that just just aren't effective right now. Um so I think his timing's off a little bit with some of his rush, but he's very, very much still working back, and I haven't quite gotten myself to the moment where I feel like, yeah, he's close. He's close to really being able to make an impact and be the Von Miller that we want to see. Now, I did th- think that from the Jaguars game to the Giants game, he looked a lot better to me, but I th- still kind of think we're stuck in that moment, right? Like, we're stuck in that moment of, hey, you were better from the Jags to the Giants but there hasn't been another step from that. And so I'll, I'll obviously keep watching and paying attention to uh, what he's offering, but I don't think that next step has happened. Maybe this extended rest uh, will create a good opportunity for him to be more effective in the next game against Cincinnati, but he's not there yet. I want to mention Puna Ford. Uh, this was by far Puna Ford's best showing as a Bills defensive tackle, I, I put probably four or five Puna Ford clips in the Discord channel uh, before recording this podcast, kind of talking through what he was doing. But whether it was run defense or rushing the passer, he was really effective. Um, resetting the line of scrimmage, showing ability to uh, get off contact, um, fight pressure with pressure, and and really be firm against the run. But also the pass rush was cooking a little bit too. Uh, he, he played good. He, he made an impact in this game, a really encouraging needed something like that. Um, because, you know, outside of Ed Oliver, we've been kind of wondering, all right, is anybody going to make a play? Is anybody going to do anything? And, you know, Jordan Phillips had a couple of good rushes. Tim Settle had a couple of good moments, mostly, mostly bad out of Tim Settle, not playing with good balance or control and being out of his fits. 
But at least for this game, Puna Ford looks, looked like he could be an answer. And I think he deserves the most snaps moving forward next to Ed Oliver. And so it's been a quiet start for Puna. But um, nice to see him take a big step here. And, and one thing to be mindful of with Puna Ford is, you know, he played for Seattle, odd front defenses, uh, playing as a two-gapping nose tackle. And, you know, even last year, he's playing a lot of four-eye and five technique. And, and this is a very stylistically different defense uh, under Sean McDermott, what he's asked to do. And so maybe we should have anticipated a little bit of a slow start. But, man, if he can, can sustain the level of play he had against Tampa moving forward, that's going to be big for this Bills defense. And so encouraging to see that. You know, I, I thought the Bills' pass rush overall was pretty sound. Um, you know, Baker Mayfield, we talked about it, not pressured a ton this year and certainly not sacked a lot. Uh, his ability to not allow pressure to turn into sacks is second best in the league behind Patrick Mahomes and a tick better than Josh Allen. You certainly saw why that's the case uh, in this game. But, you know, the Bills were still able to pressure Baker Mayfield on 21 of 48 dropbacks. That's 44%. And Baker had only been pressured on 33% of snaps entering the game. He'd only been sacked eight times all year. The Bills got him sacked three times uh, in the game. So I thought you saw some good things from the Bills' pass rush, even if there were some moments where you wish it was a little bit more impactful. Defensive snap counts. The Bills played 67 snaps of defense. Ed Oliver, uh, we'll go to defensive tackle. Ed Oliver, 35 of 67 snaps. Jordan Phillips, 32. Tim Settle, 28. Puna Ford, 26. At defensive end, Leonard Floyd, 41 of 67. Greg Rousseau, 39. Von Miller, 26. A.J. Epinesa, 21. Shaq Lawson, 17. Kingsley Jonathan, Jonathan, 3. At linebacker, Bernard played all 67 snaps. Tyrell Dotson, 42. Dorian Williams, 0. At cornerback, uh, Benford, Johnson, and Jackson played all 67 snaps. At safety, Hyde and Poyer, all 67 snaps. And then Taylor Rapp, 25 snaps, which would be those moments where Jordan Poyer goes down and plays linebacker. A couple other uh, notes here as it relates to snap counts, players uh, that didn't play offense or defense but did play special teams. Uh, Andy Isabella called up for this game nine snaps on special teams. Josh Norman called up for this game five snaps on special teams. All of those coming on the kickoff team. Uh, Dorian Williams, 18 snaps of special teams. And then one thing that's interesting about Kingsley Jonathan is the Bills continue to dress six defensive ends every week. He is a four-phase special teams player for the Bills, which is kind of cool. You remember Daryl Johnson uh, doing that for a, a few years while well, Kingsley Jonathan is doing it as well. So a defensive end that plays all phases of special teams, that's kind of fun. Studs and duds. Uh, no duds this week. I don't think anybody played that bad where I had put him down as a dud. But I do have some studs. Deion Dawkins. I think Deion Dawkins is very clearly having the best season of his career. Lockdown and pass protection. Uh, but his run blocking and him being such an uh, integral part of that tackle rap play, uh, he is playing good football and in the best of his career. Josh Allen, you go down as a stud for your week over week improvements and a lot of production. Dalton Kincaid, you're a stud. He is a stud. I mean, uh, we were we were oohing and on over some of those plays in the Discord channel with the body control and that sideline catch, uh, the adjustment that he made on the RPO to, to reach back and catch that football and like still sustain his upfield momentum. Dalton Kincaid, and the, the touchdown was a really fun play where um, it was a great job by Dalton to recognize quickly that Josh was bailing on the pocket. And so Josh, he bails a clean pocket and rolls to his right, and Dalton Kincaid recognizes it quick and just runs across the field, scores a touchdown. Uh, fun play there. Khalil Shakir is a stud. You led the team in receiving. You caught every target, plays down the field, yards after catch, good route running. Gabe Davis, you go down as a stud. Um, I thought you won more because of how Ken Dorsey used you than your ability to create separation, but I think he needed to have a productive game, and he did. Jordan Poyer, you go down as a stud. Puna Ford goes down as a stud. And, of course, Sam Martin goes down as a stud. So Dawkins, Josh Allen, De uh, Dalton Kincaid, Khalil Shakir, Gabe Davis, Jordan Poyer, Puna Ford, Sam Martin, your studs. No duds this week. All right, so that's going to do it for us here today. Next week, we got some fun stuff happening uh, because the Bills don't play on Sunday. There's no game to react to. There's no All-22 review to get to. So we have a chance to get into some other stuff. We'll obviously get to herd mentality early next week. 
The trade deadline is Tuesday at 4 o'clock, so if there's anything to react to there, of course, we will do it. I'll give you my second quarter report card. We did this after the first quarter. The Bills have a fresh set of four games to evaluate. We can measure the growth or lack thereof. And then, of course, we'll get into Bengals prep. So a lot going on here on Locked On Bills. Don't miss it. Get in this subtext community so you can get in the Discord. Have a great weekend. As always, I kindly ask that you share, subscribe, rate, and review. Again, enjoy your weekend. Go Bills. And I look forward to catching up with you again on Monday.